Just over a hundred days ago, a deadly virus took an unprepared world by storm. COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. But as the world scrambled to react to this growing emergency, an astonishing global scientific effort began to understand the nature of this new enemy and how we could fight it. We really have recruited a microscopic army. Horizon has assembled a team of BBC science experts to analyse the urgent work being done to combat this crisis. You can just look at the tubes and go, yep, that one has coronavirus and that one does not. To tell the story of where this virus sprang from. That's a very good environment for a new virus to emerge from a mutation. What makes it so infectious? This new coronavirus is already primed and ready to infect. And how science is trying to suppress the spread and find a cure at a pace never seen before. The race is not against each other, it's against the virus itself. We're facing one of the greatest medical and scientific challenges in history. With new information emerging at an astonishing rate, this is a battle we are fighting not just in the lab, but also with numbers and data. More than ever, it's the scientific response that will be crucial in determining the future of this pandemic. We may never know the exact origin of this pandemic. But some scientists believe the very first cases of COVID-19 started somewhere in central China as early as November last year. In December, a 57-year-old seafood trader in Wuhan phones in sick to say she has a fever and a cough. By the 18th, the symptoms are so severe, the woman is admitted to hospital. A few days later, several more patients are admitted with similar flu-like symptoms. On December 24th, Doctors collect the first sample for genetic sequencing. And five days later, the Wuhan Center for Disease Control begins an investigation into the source of an outbreak. They discover that many patients work at Wuhan Seafood Market, where wild animals are also sold. At Wuhan Central Hospital, a doctor called Li Wanliang receives a lab report that suggests the infection might be caused by a SARS-like virus. As news of the outbreak starts to circulate on social media, the Chinese authorities are forced to tell the World Health Organization. It's largely under control. Most patients are showing lighter symptoms and some of them have already been discharged. The Chinese Center for Disease Control blames wild animals as the source of the mystery virus, and they order the closure of the seafood market on January the 1st. In central China, an outbreak of an unknown pneumonia-like virus, which officials say comes from the same family as the deadly SARS virus. Just two weeks after collecting the first sample, Chinese authorities announced the identity of the virus. But it's not the SARS virus. While it's from the same coronavirus family, this is a completely new strain. The big challenge in those early days was that no one knew what we were dealing with. For humans, this was a completely new pathogen, a type of coronavirus. Now, viruses are extraordinary things. Some people say that they're not living organisms, but really I think of them as the simplest form of life. They're typically a fatty membrane which encloses a shell made of protein which itself protects a scrap of genetic code, either DNA or, in this case, RNA, both are basic sets of genetic instructions. But here's the catch. To reproduce, all viruses have to hijack the cells 
of other organisms. So the viruses in the droplets produced when a patient with this new coronavirus, for example, coughs or sneezes, they can't reproduce unless they get inside the cells of another human being. And they get inside the cells using these red protein spikes on the surface of the virus. Now these bind to receptors on the surface of the cell. And that allows them to get inside the cell. They shed that membrane and the, the protein capsid. And then the virus genetic code is interpreted by the cell as its own genetic code. And that turns the cell into a virus factory, creating thousands more copies of the virus. Viruses infect all life forms, animals, plants, even bacteria. The current pandemic of COVID-19 is caused by a coronavirus. Corona is the Latin name for crown. And these viruses look like round balls covered in these spikes, giving them this crown shape. This coronavirus is one of many. There are four that commonly circulate in humans, some of which we think have been around for hundreds, even thousands of years. And they usually cause cold and flu-like symptoms. The problem comes when a new strain of coronavirus emerges, like the one that caused the SARS outbreak in 2003 or this current pandemic. But where do these new strains emerge from and why? Within just a few weeks of the outbreak, scientists had mapped the virus's genome Hazel, hi. and discovered that it shares 96% of its genetic code with a virus found in bats. So I've got a brown long-eared bat here. Hazel Ryan is a bat conservationist. Bats don't have a great reputation when it comes to very dangerous diseases. If we think of rabies, Ebola, MERS, SARS and this new coronavirus we think have all come from bats. Why is that? Well, it's really because bats are able to carry these diseases without actually getting sick themselves. And even if they are introduced to um, pathogens in a lab, um, they don't seem to get sick. They, it doesn't induce a fever. We're not sure why bats have such powerful immune systems. There. Oh, look at that. But one theory is linked to the fact that they're the world's only flying mammal. As this bat flies around, it has a gigantically high metabolism. It's making far more heat than a human would through exercise. In flight, a bat's heart rate can shoot up to over a thousand beats per minute. All that exertion takes a huge toll on their bodies. So bats have evolved to quickly repair cell damage. That could be one of the reasons that bats can host over a hundred different viruses without getting sick. But how does a virus make the jump from a bat to a human? A bat coronavirus can infect another bat because spike proteins on its surface have adapted to attach to the cells of that species. But they can't usually attach to the cells of another species. However, that can change. So the remarkable thing about bats is that bats live in their own cities, groups of tens of thousands or even millions of individuals. And a city, a group of animals that big is, is a unique environment because that enables viruses to be continually passed around. As they pass from bat to bat, the virus's genetic code is copied billions of times. But with so many copies being made, errors can creep in, called mutations. These mutations in the genetic code can subtly change the virus, reshaping those outer proteins, occasionally enabling them to latch onto the cells of a new species. But in this case, it's thought that it wasn't enough for the virus to infect humans. For that, it may have needed a helping hand. Ultimately, we're very sure that this coronavirus did originally come from a bat. And that's because it shares 96% of its genome with the bat virus. But it may have jumped to another animal before going to a human. And we know this has happened with another very dangerous coronavirus called MERS, where bats transmit the virus to camels who then pass it to humans. 
In this case, we think the intermediary animal might have been something called a pangolin. If a bat virus has travelled through an intermediary animal before, it could do it again. Scientists looking at coronaviruses in pangolins noticed cases where their outer spikes, crucial for infecting cells, were very similar to the one found on this new human virus. The theory is, passing through the pangolin allowed the virus to evolve so it could infect humans. Pangolins and bats are caught in huge numbers from the wild, then trafficked to wet markets like this, where they're traded for meat. Live animals awaiting slaughter can be exposed to infected blood, urine or other bodily fluids. It's the perfect opportunity for a virus to jump species. But wildlife markets are only part of the problem. Nearly a third of all cases where viruses jump from animals to humans are thought to be caused by changes in land use and intensive farming. Veterinary pathologist Professor Andrew Cunningham specialises in wildlife diseases. It's not a coincidence that we talk about avian influenza and swine influenza. Those are the two species that are farmed intensively the most around the world. Thousands and thousands of animals packed in together, and that's a very good environment for a new virus to uh, emerge from a mutation. With lots of one species in one place, a virus can rapidly infect thousands of individuals. As it multiplies, the chance of this virus mutating into one that can jump species dramatically increases. We are reducing the biodiversity on our planet and we are interacting with what wildlife has left in a way that we haven't historically done before. And those two things combined, um, we think, are allowing these pathogens to jump over from wildlife hosts into people. There are no easy answers here. Farming and intensive land use produce the food we've grown so accustomed to. But this is an area that must change if we want to reduce the risk of future pandemics. At the start of an outbreak like this, when you don't know very much about the biology or the impact that a virus has on the body, numbers become a key weapon in working out how it might grow. Now that's because infectious diseases, they spread through a population in a very mathematical way. And that means that even when you've got very little data for a new outbreak, you can track where we are along that trajectory and you can scroll forwards to see how things might unfold. So let me show you a graph of how the world's COVID-19 deaths have evolved over time. And I'm going to compare that to some previous outbreaks, SARS, MERS and Ebola. Now, if I just play you the very first 20 days or so, you will see that initially coronavirus outbreak looks fairly similar to the others. But this is where it starts to split. Now, for the experts who read these numbers all of the time, it really starts to become clear just how difficult this coronavirus is going to be to contain. If I carry on here, you'll see just how quickly things start changing. If I pause it at around the 50-day mark, this here, this is uh, around when I first saw this comparison of the data. So at this stage, there had been less than 10 deaths in Italy. There had been no deaths at all in Britain. But for me personally, this is really when I realised that we were really in trouble. Because it's not just that these lines have diverged, it's not just that there are more COVID-19 deaths than SARS, MERS and Ebola, it's what happens next. Because these deaths are increasing exponentially. And I know that that's a term that you will have heard a lot recently, but at its very simplest, an exponential curve doesn't just increase steadily, it accelerates curving upwards and upwards. And tragically what that means here is that the number of deaths are doubling every few days. Because if instead, if this line had carried on on the trajectory it was at, at around the 50-day mark, actually, the number of corona deaths would be more like down here. Now, as soon as you see this data, as soon as you see the virus getting to this scale this quickly, it's clear that it will be almost impossible to contain the outbreak. 
you can't just shut down COVID-19 in the same way as, as these others here, because the numbers are telling us it is too late to stop it from spreading. The first indication that this wouldn't be contained within China came in mid-January, as a case beyond its borders was confirmed. Thailand has reported the first case of the Wuhan coronavirus found outside of China. The patient arrived at a Bangkok Suwanapum airport from Wuhan. As hundreds of thousands leave Wuhan to celebrate the Chinese New Year, there are rising fears that the virus will be disseminated across the country. January the 23rd, two days before Chinese New Year. Wuhan goes into lockdown to prevent further spread. The gates of the city clanging shut. Wuhan, home to more than twice the population of Scotland, 11 million people now sealed off from the outside world. Most public transport stops and all shops are shut, except those selling food or medicine. Within hours, the bustling city of Wuhan becomes a ghost town. But the number of cases continues to rise. On the 7th of February, Dr. Li Wanliang, who was one of the first to sound the alarm, becomes China's latest victim. Like the other types of coronavirus, this one enters our bodies through our mouth, our nose and our eyes. And then it binds to cells in the upper respiratory tract. Now, the most common symptom seems to be fever. And that's part of the immune system's response evolved, we think, to make the body a less hospitable environment for infections. Inflammation in the throat and in those airways causes that dry cough that lots of patients have. And many people have also reported a total loss of smell and taste. But it's when the virus starts to replicate deep in the lungs that it can become a really serious problem. You might think your lungs are like balloons, but really they're more like sponges. They're full of blood vessels surrounding tiny air sacs. These are the alveoli. This is where oxygen gets from the air into the blood. Now, when cells in the alveoli get infected, it causes a viral pneumonia. Your immune system responds. Chemicals called cytokines draw white blood cells into the area to help fight the infection. This image is a CT scan of someone with severe pneumonia caused by COVID-19. The purple areas are where there's that inflammation, and you can see how much of that lung is affected. In this case, the immune response is starting to get out of control. It's what we call a cytokine storm. Inflammatory fluid and cells starts to fill up the alveoli, preventing oxygen getting into the blood. In severe cases, this is what we call an acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ART. Patients like this start having to breathe harder to maintain oxygen levels, and once that effort becomes too great, they need ventilation. And a ventilator is really, in simple terms, a mechanical bellows that can take over the work of breathing. Now, we've seen with some of the recent headlines that there is this spectrum of disease with COVID-19. Some people are totally unaware they've been infected, whilst others lose their lives. Every death is a genuine human tragedy, and it's difficult to talk about them as though they're just statistics. But in any outbreak, numbers are an incredibly powerful tool to help experts work out how far-reaching it is and who it will impact. But numbers can also be extremely slippery. You can't think of numbers as cold, hard facts. Let me show you what I mean. Here is the data for the number of new cases over a 24-hour period for some of the world's worst affected countries. Now, by the time that this is broadcast, these numbers will have already changed, but the principle here is what's important. So from this graph here, the US is the highest in a 24-hour period. Meanwhile, Italy, the UK and Germany are roughly about even. Now, this data is very valuable, but it is not the complete picture because you cannot tell how many people have the virus 
unless you are testing them. So if instead I show you the number of tests that have been conducted in that same 24 hours, you will see something quite different. Now again, the US here are the highest with 100,000 tests in 24 hours. But look at this, Italy, are testing more than three times the number of people as the UK and Germany here are conducting about five times more tests. Now all of this points to the suspicion that the UK actually has way more cases than the numbers suggest. Some scientists have even estimated that we are only recording between five to ten percent of symptomatic cases and that is part of the reason why you will see analysts increasingly talking about deaths rather than cases. Now let me show you the data from China for the proportion of serious cases and deaths by age group. There is no doubt that this is a virus that disproportionately affects older people but this here isn't the entire picture and it's very easy to miss something significant because if you look at the total number of reported cases far more people in their 40s and their 50s are catching this disease than people who are in their 70s and 80s and that means that there are still many people under 50 who are still seriously affected but unless you test absolutely everyone, even children, even people who don't have any symptoms, we really don't know these numbers for sure. Whatever the difficulties with the data, there's a clear demographic pattern here. We would typically expect high risk of death for the very young, then it falls as you are a young person, adolescent, and then it gradually rises again through middle age toward old age. Joy, we've seen evidence that there may be something about these novel coronaviruses that is different in young children. What might that thing be? What's really interesting is that children get less severe disease. So one possible hypothesis is around the ACE2 receptors that the uh, coronavirus is binding to, which are particularly found in your lung epithelial tissue. So if we look at the, the, the section of lung tissue here, lots of people may be aware of these sort of hair-like um, cilia that, that waft bugs and, and dirt back out so they can be coughed up. These are the lung cells. And this is an example of the kind of tissue where those receptors that the virus can bind to are found. And do we know if those receptors are different in children? Yes, they are different in children. And there has been work, uh, particularly during the SARS-2 epidemic, so papers that were published kind of soon after that. Unfortunately, that work stopped. But I believe as a scientist that there must be something more specific to SARS and to COVID that is causing this pattern. So why exactly those very young people are spared is, is not clear. Are they in some senses completely immune? Yeah, I think there are two very dangerous myths. So the first one is children are immune, they're not getting the infection, that's wrong. And then the second myth is that children will never die. Children, you know, are, are not vulnerable at all. And, and that is incorrect. So in the latest data, which are still from very limited numbers, uh, it's uh, projected to be around 0.006%. But if you apply that to a large number of children, so in the UK, 13 uh, 0.5 million children, that's still going to be about 800 deaths. So this is really a critical myth to bust. There's been also some interesting data coming out that men, particularly men in China, seem to be at greater risk of severe disease and death than women. What do you think about that data? Well, as a woman, I like to think we have superpowers and there is some evidence that some of the X-linked chromosome immune functions, because women have two X chromosomes, may mean that we have a stronger immune response, for example, to viruses. But there are also gendered health behaviours, so smoking. So in that population of Chinese men, they were of a generation where women hardly smoked. So the smoking risk factor is very much more with men. Joy, thanks very much. As global deaths rise to over 500, the World Health Organization declares there is no known effective treatment. 
With 25 countries now infected, labs around the world are in a race against the virus to create a vaccine. It requires international effort and resources. The world's best brains have been mobilized. Our greatest hope lies in science. Meanwhile, in Wuhan, there's a glimmer of hope. China's daily infection figures drop below 2,000 for the second day. The price has been high, but it looks like the brutal lockdown is beginning to work. China has rolled out probably the most ambitious and I would say agile and aggressive uh, disease containment effort in history. But what worries me most is, has the rest of the world learned the lesson of speed? One country where the lesson of speed has been learned is South Korea. They suffered another coronavirus outbreak in 2015, the MERS virus, and the country has been preparing for another epidemic ever since. With the number of cases rising fast, the health authorities embark on mass testing rather than lockdown to suppress the spread. Drive-through clinics have been set up to test as many people as possible, Patients don't even have to get out of the car as the swabs are taken. And crucially, it avoids medics coming into contact with those infected. Testing is a powerful tool in fighting any outbreak because it provides the vital data needed to track the spread of the virus. One of the problems is that it's really hard to tell from symptoms if you have the new coronavirus. So even if you do have a fever and a dry cough, those symptoms could be caused by lots and lots of other viruses. So the only way to be sure is through testing. But it's much easier to talk about testing than it is to actually do it. In the UK, the current test that the NHS uses for the new coronavirus is actually looking for the genetic material packaged up inside it. Step one of the test is to get hold of some virus. We know that it attaches to receptors in the mouth and down into the airway. So the best way of getting hold of a bit of it is to swab the tonsils and get some snot from the nose. <coughs> and what we've got there is a very small amount of snot, saliva, and if I was infected, we'd have some virus there as well. And there's a clever way to detect even minuscule quantities in the lab using a technique called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. So this is my sample here, and if I had coronavirus, there would be a very small amount of virus genetic material on the end of the swab. So I could get that out, and I would put it in a tube, something a little bit like this. The tube would contain a cocktail of chemicals that can locate any strands of viral genetic material in the sample and multiply them. Inside the PCR machine, the tube is heated and cooled repeatedly. Each cycle doubles the number of strands. And after about 30 cycles, one strand can become over a billion, making the virus easier to detect. This test is amazingly sensitive at turning a very small amount of genetic material into a very large amount. This is how millions of people across the world have been tested so far. It's the gold standard, but there's a catch. It needs scientists and it needs complex equipment and crucially, it takes quite a long time, about two and a half hours just to run those cycles. So what we need is a much faster test because we are gonna to have to test tens of millions of people in the coming weeks and months. Luckily, there's a shortcut. A team at this Oxford University lab hopes to dramatically cut the time it takes and the need for expensive kit and trained professionals. They're trialling a testing technique that's been around for 20 years and might now be repurposed to detect this new coronavirus. Biomedical engineer Dr Jane Cha Chin Shi is working on the project. So I got two uh, samples. One is a positive control that contains uh, viral genetic materials, uh -huh. and the other one is a negative control. So basically, it's a positive control to make sure that the test is able to detect virus, and then you've also got a negative control to make sure that the test doesn't detect virus when it's not there. Yeah, that's correct. 
Inside the tubes is a pre-mixed soup of chemicals, similar to those in the PCR test. The difference is that this team has developed chemicals that can locate the viral genetic material accurately and multiply it without the need for repeated reheating. So this test can be kept at a constant 65 Celsius for just half an hour. If the virus is present, there'll be a colour change. So after 30 minutes, we can see that the positive control has already changed the colour into yellow, while the negative one remains pinkish. So this is amazing. All you've done is, is get your premixed tubes, add the sample, put it in the heat block, and then you can just look at the tubes and go, yep, that one has coronavirus and that one does not. Correct. Jane and her colleagues believe that this novel test is so simple they can turn it into a kit people could do at home, using nothing more complicated than a hot drinks flask. So once you've perfected this method, if you sent me a tube at home, I could get a swab, put it in the tube, and then I could just look at the colour result myself. Yep, that's our ultimate goal. The process still needs to go through stringent trials to make sure the chemicals used are very precise at locating the coronavirus genetic material. The hope is that this test, or one of dozens of similar tests being developed around the world, could be available in the near future. All of the current tests will tell you if you currently have the virus, but attention is now focusing on another type of test, known as a serology or antibody test. And that will tell you if you've ever had the virus in the past. How does knowing whether or not people have antibodies in their blood, so evidence that they have previously been infected, how does that change the way we think about a disease. In the last pandemic we had, which was the swine, swine flu, flu H1N1 yeah. pandemic, this was a complete game changer in terms of the um, epidemiology, the prediction of number of cases that were infected. And we are able to predict that actually there weren't going to be as many deaths as we thought there would be. So how does the serology test actually work? Because of course our blood is full of many, many different kinds of antibodies. So Whereas the PCR test for nas on nasal mucus depends on whether you've hit the right spot with your swab and whether you've got it to the lab properly, taking a blood sample gives you an absolute estimation of what that person's been exposed to in the past. So it's a much more constant, much more, um, much more solid measure of viral exposure. And it tells you whether you've been exposed in the past. It's really important information in terms of knowing about the epidemiology Peter, if you think maybe you had the virus several months ago, and this is going to be more important as the epidemic goes on, do you think those antibodies would go away and so you, there is a sort of window in which you need to have that test? Mm. So the antibody will trend down over time after having reached this plateau at around a month. I would expect the antibody would still be there in sufficient quantity to show up on the test at least a year, possibly much longer after the, um, after the infections occurred. If we do manage soon to develop a, an accurate, sensitive test for the correct cor coronavirus antibodies, if I then have that test and find I do have the antibodies, yep. that will indicate that I had the virus. Will that also indicate that I am immune? Yeah, well, I wish we knew. I think from what we know about coronaviruses and immunity to them, I, I can be pretty confident in saying that if you've got the antibody, you're going to be resistant to infection for at least three months. That's, a, that's the minimum. I mean, it could be that it's going to be a year. That would be quite likely. It could be that because this is a novel coronavirus, which we've never been exposed to before, we're actually going to get much more long-lasting immunity, which could last five years or possibly for life. So it could be that we're actually going to develop really good, solid immunity. I think that's the best hope and expectation. By the first week of March, South Korea records 44 deaths, while Iran's triples. Only one other country's death toll is overtaking Iran. The first known cases in Italy were two Chinese tourists. There are now 6,000 cases. Italy is in lockdown. The only noises that you can hear are 
you know, the church bells, which is nice, but the other noise is the ambulances. On March the 11th, the World Health Organization declares the COVID-19 outbreak a pandemic. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. With the death toll nearing 2,000, Italy is on course to overtake China as the world's worst hit country. Europe is the new epicenter of the disease. One of the most important things that scientists need to work out is how many people, on average, a contagious person could infect. Now, the scientists call this the, the transmission rate, or sometimes they refer to it as the R0. And the R0 of seasonal flu is around 1.3. Let me show you what that actually means. Every square on this chessboard is going to represent a new round of transmission. If we start off with one infected person, they will go on to infect 1.3 others, which I'm going to represent with 1.3 grains of rice. Now, each of those people are also going to go on to infect 1.3 others. So by the second round of transmission, it's up to two people. These numbers, they're going to steadily increase each time until eight rounds of transmission, when it will be up to eight new people contracting the seasonal flu. Now, the transmission rates that are naught of COVID-19 is approximately 2.5. And that doesn't seem like it makes much of a difference, but even this very small change actually has a dramatic impact. Because the first transmission means that two and a half people will get infected. The second round, it's six people. And by eight rounds of transmission, it is this many people. That means that if we did nothing, one single infection would spark off a chain of transmission that within two months would leave 99,339 people infected with the virus. And based on some estimates, that means that up to 1,000 people in this single chain of transmission would go on to very sadly lose their lives. Now, this is terrifying. However, there is also some better news because best estimates from research released last week is that with all of the social distancing measures we currently have in place, the transmission rate of the new coronavirus in the UK has plummeted to 0.62. So just by staying at home, we all have it in our power to change the course of this pandemic. But what is it about this virus that makes it so infectious? This virus is spreading across the globe like wildfire and it appears to be one of the most contagious in human history. So I'm here because I want to find out exactly how it's passing from person to person so quickly. At the Francis Crick Institute in London, structural biologist Dr Donald Benton believes the answer may lie in how the coronavirus's unique molecular structure helps it to attack our body cells. So viruses infect our cells first of all by attaching to the cell surface and they do this by a protein on the surface of the virus. For instance, I have a picture here of flu viruses. On the surface here, you can see these little rod shapes are influenza hemagglutinin molecules, which are the spike protein of a flu virus. These spike proteins latch onto our cells and pass on the disease. Research suggests that this new coronavirus could be up to 10 times more efficient at attaching itself than SARS. The team here are part of a global effort to create the first images of spike proteins on the new coronavirus. They think it could hold important clues as to why it passes on the disease so effectively. So this coronavirus needs to first of all bind to the surface of the cell, and then it needs to enter the cell and release its genetic material. And both of these activities are controlled by this spike protein. What is it about this spike protein that makes it more effective than other viruses? 
So the surface of the protein which attaches to the cell is different. It has a different mechanism of priming the protein so that it can release the genetic material into the cell. For the coronavirus to infect our cells, the spike protein must first be split open or cut by an enzyme. This activates or primes the virus for infection. In normal coronaviruses, this cutting happens after the virus is taken up by the cell. But the idea with this new coronavirus is that it's already cut when the virus leaves the cell. So it's already primed and, and ready to infect when it leaves. The structure of this coronavirus means its protein spikes are already cut and primed before it comes into contact with a healthy cell, which could make the infection process easier. So by having that one less step, it's a quicker process for it to yeah. be able to replicate. So it could make it more transmissible. The infection and transmission rate of the virus is one of the crucial pieces of information that the scientists modelling the pandemic use in their predictions. And right from the beginning, modelling the scale of the outbreak has been at the heart of government responses. We are all living under the lockdown that is a result of decisions based on modelling. But Adam, this is a crisis that's constantly evolving. How do you model something like this? Models are really a tool we can use to ask what if questions. What if you change interactions in a certain way? What effect might it have on the outbreak? You were one of the very first people who were modeling this outbreak back in January, right? Yes. And of course, there was one model in particular that got a lot of attention in the press, a model by uh, Imperial College London, looking at the impact of different interventions. So this graph has got time along the x-axis and critical care beds up the side. This is the classic curve. So what we see here is the scenario where everyone just carries on as normal and the epidemic continues. Terrifyingly large. Exactly, and this is looking at a range of moderate interventions. Things like school closures, having more people working from home, maybe people self-isolating when they've got symptoms. And you can see that all of these different measures will slow the outbreak, so it will mean that there's less transmission, the peak is happening later, there's a reduction in the size, but it's not a huge reduction. Yeah. Even with all of those interventions, when you actually include the critical care line, this is kind of a worrying picture. Yes, this line is what was likely to be the capacity of critical care, so intensive care unit type beds in the UK. And you can see that although some of these interventions reduce the size of the peak a lot, in terms of the, the demand you're requiring in hospital, it's still many, many times larger than the likely capacity that would be available. It's not enough. It's Nowhere not near enough. enough. And that's why we're in lockdown now. Yes, uh, so this model and, and a number of other ones showed that you couldn't have these, these single, fairly moderate interventions that would be enough to, to make this manageable for, for the NHS. That really, without more dramatic uh, reductions in transmission, these lockdown-type measures, you weren't going to flatten the curve enough to get below this line. This is where we were. Is it where we still are? Lockdown measure it is going far, far beyond what any of these, these shorter, maybe kind of slightly lighter measures are doing. So I think it's likely our case numbers are now going to be much, much lower because we've got this, this lockdown in place. Is there a date in the future that we can hope for lockdown to start to be lifted? It will probably be looking at, at the period of a few weeks. Um, in China, for example, they had a lockdown of about two months before they started opening up. Um, other countries in Europe are now starting to, to think about lifting things. But it's this really tough balance to strike because if you lift it too early, you're still going to have a lot of infection in your population and the outbreak can take off again. But obviously, the longer you leave it in place, the tougher that is on a population. Across the world, to help lift the lockdown, scientists are racing to create a vaccine. And just 69 days after the virus was sequenced, human trials for a vaccine begin in the USA. The first patient, a 43-year-old from Seattle. On March the 23rd, the UK joins Italy, France and Spain by declaring a nationwide lockdown. COVID-19 is also tightening its grip on the US, where there are already around 42,000 cases and 470 deaths. This is a movie, it can't be real. Even the gambling capital of the world is forced to shut its doors. 
On the day the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo is postponed, the Indian population of 1.3 billion is given less than four hours' notice of a total lockdown. On Tuesday night, India's Prime Minister ordered citizens to stay at home for the next three weeks. Lockdown. A three-week lockdown has been announced in South Africa. President Mohamed Buhari has declared a curfew, restricting movements in Lagos. 22 days after the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic, around a quarter of the planet's population is in lockdown, and the number of cases around the world passes one million. As the virus spreads, there's more and more pressure to try and find a vaccine. Now, vaccines stimulate our immune system by essentially mimicking infections. Critical to any immune response are these small Y-shaped proteins found throughout your body and your bloodstream. These are antibodies. And you've got a huge diversity of antibodies inside you. And each different one binds to a specific pathogen, a virus or a bacteria, and they latch onto the outer surface and deactivate it. Now, during an infection, your body ramps up production of the particular antibody that attacks the thing that is infecting you. But this takes a little while. So the first time you get an infection, the virus can take hold and replicate before there are enough antibodies produced to contain it. But your immune system remembers almost every infection that you've ever had, and it maintains those antibody levels from previous infections. And that's why you can't get most viruses twice. Since none of us have ever encountered this coronavirus before, we don't have any antibodies ready to stop it replicating. And that means we can become critically ill or even die before enough antibodies are made. Now, what a vaccine does is it gives our immune systems a safe shortcut. It usually involves injecting an inactivated dead sample of the virus that can't cause any symptoms. It won't make you ill but it will stimulate the body to make lots of those specific antibodies that can fight the actual virus if you ever meet it. Now, finding a safe, effective vaccine is far from easy, but scientists are looking for innovative solutions. Professor Robin Shattuck and his team at Imperial College London are trying to develop a world first a safe and effective synthetic vaccine using cutting-edge genetic techniques. Can you explain to me the difference between a conventional vaccine and your approach? What's different about our vaccine is what we want to use is the spike on the surface of the virus. That corona that you see on those pictures of those red spikes sticking outside. Robin's plan for his vaccine is to introduce just the outer spike of the virus into the body. Even though it is only a part of the virus, it should trigger a powerful response from the person's immune system. But unlike traditional vaccines, he's building the spike from scratch, using the virus's own genome, its genetic blueprint. Chinese scientists published the genetic sequence of the virus on the 10th of January. We were able to identify from that sequence the genetic code that uh, encodes the protein that's on the surface of the virus, what we call the, the viral spike, and use that to design our prototype vaccine. Robin's vaccine contains the spike's genetic recipe. It should trick our body into making the spikes itself. In here you can see we have vials of our prototype the vaccine is injected into the muscle and that blueprint, that code, tells the muscles to start churning out the spikes that would normally be expressed on a whole virus. Even though it's our own body producing the spikes, the immune system still recognises them as foreign and produces antibodies to combat them. So the muscle will start producing lots and lots of spikes. And the idea is that that will rouse the immune system and you get the antibody response and that can hopefully protect you against infection by this particular virus. That's exactly how the vaccine works. The real advantage of Robin's approach 
is that because the vaccine is synthetic, built entirely in the laboratory, it can be produced in volume, incredibly fast. So these uh, flasks contain bacteria that are producing the genetic material that's used to synthesize the vaccine. These bacteria can produce the genetic template within a day, essentially, and so that's really quick and fast for starting a whole process. The bacteria are genetically modified to produce the template, which is sent to an industrial laboratory to produce on a vast scale. So you really have recruited a microscopic army, haven't you? Absolutely. Here, bacteria are our friends. This capability has inspired them to aim for an ambitious target. Now, the thing that's really exciting is because we can manufacture very quickly, we could have five million doses ready by the winter. This is still dependent on successful trials. It would be a world first for a vaccine of this sort. And that comes with its own challenges. A license has never been granted for a vaccine like this. To ensure it's safe and that it works, it must go through rigorous testing. So the next step is we've started a study in macaques with monkeys. monkeys, and that will tell us whether the vaccine works at preventing infection in that animal model. It's still an animal model. That doesn't mean it proves it will work in, work in humans. But it is much closer to humans. Much so macaques closer. actually get COVID-19, do they? They do get infected, and they get some degree of symptoms. Robin hopes to have results within a matter of weeks. And his team are just one of over 40 groups involved in developing a vaccine at an unprecedented pace. A group at the Jenner Institute in Oxford is on the verge of starting human trials, while teams elsewhere have already begun. An astonishing global effort. So the good news is there are a lot of people in this race. And the race is not against each other, it's against the virus to get something out there that can save life. A new vaccine probably won't be ready for at least 12 to 18 months. And even that would be an exceptionally fast turnaround. But if we do get one, the numbers suggest it will be a game changer. Let me explain why. If I show you this simulation here, this is a, a very simple simulation of what happens during an outbreak. Now, the red dot in the middle is an infected person, and every time they bump into a white dot, a susceptible person, they infect them. You see here a graph of the running totals as it goes along. Now, over time, people recover and turn uh, yellow, and you can see them up there. Now, this is a totally susceptible population, and by the end, 196 people will have recovered um, from this virus. However, if you can vaccinate just a certain percentage of the population, let me show you this here, it's the same simulation again, but now the vaccinated people are represented by blue dots. Uh, so these are people who are immune from picking up uh, the virus, but they are not just protected themselves. In many ways, they're actually protecting all of the people who do not have vaccinations, all of the white dots here, the susceptible people. You can see that this, this virus is not spreading through the population in the same way. Now, this is called herd immunity. It can be achieved by a vaccine, but also potentially by people who gain natural immunity by recovering from the virus, as long as there are enough of them. And crucially, if the natural immunity from the new virus lasts for long enough. If you remember R0, that was the number of people that each person goes on to infect. Well, if we bring that into the herd immunity calculation, it tells us that for this coronavirus, you need around two thirds of the population to be immune to stop the virus from taking hold. And this is why some experts are so worried about a second wave. Because without these vaccinated people, without these people in blue, there is a real worry that as soon as we start to return to normality, even a single infected person could start up yet another serious outbreak on our shores. 
A vaccine is the hope for the future, but there's uncertainty about when and indeed if it can be made. After all, after 40 years of trying, we still don't have an effective vaccine for HIV. And the fastest we've ever produced a vaccine from scratch is with Ebola, and that took around five years. So where else can we look for a solution? Trudy, we're constantly hearing media reports about potential miracle cures for coronavirus. Are we trialling lots of new drugs? So across the globe right now, there's over 600 trials that are testing potential therapeutic interventions for coronavirus for COVID-19. And they're across the whole spectrum from really early stages of, of the disease right through to the severe diseases in hospital. How exactly do antiviral drugs work? Antivirals work by um, either stopping the virus entering a cell in the first place or when it gets inside the cell, stopping it from being able to divide within the cell. And at the beginning of the disease is when you get that huge increase in the amount of virus in a patient. And that's really the best place to stop the disease before the worst symptoms can occur. It makes me think that as far as I'm aware, we don't have any really effective antiviral drugs for the kind of the really common viruses that cause severe airway or respiratory infections. In the history of medical science now, we don't have a drug that we can take easily just to treat those respiratory infections, as you say. This is obviously a novel virus. Do we know enough about it yet to start developing brand new drugs? I don't think we're going to have time. The problem in outbreaks is you have this very finite window in which to run um, clinical trials. So, for example, when we were working in the Ebola outbreak, we ran the first trials ever to happen in those sorts of situations. So we managed to do that within 16 weeks to get the trial started. And, and here we're seeing these timelines brought down even more. And so we're unlikely to have that time within the window. From what you're saying, I get the impression you're optimistic that we will run some very good trials, but I'm not feeling huge optimism that we will get a drug that will be really effective in limiting disease in coronavirus? Yeah, I think that's, that's a fair point. I think it's, it's such a tall order. We have to pick the right drug, the right dose, testing it in the right population of people. And it's quite a gamble of whether we've lined all those things up or not. So I'm quite confident we'll run trials that answer the questions, the trials set. But whether or not that results in a drug that we can say we can use for coronaviruses, we have to wait and see. Since the deadly virus first struck in December, it's claimed over 85,000 lives worldwide. In the war against COVID-19, health workers risk their lives every day. Medical researchers trial vaccines, design reliable test kits, and develop epidemiological models to track this unfolding pandemic. This global crisis is hard on everyone. But when it's over, the sacrifices of our health workers and our scientists will be remembered. Never has so much depended on science so urgently. What's remarkable about this pandemic is not just how unprecedented it is and how quickly it has changed the lives of everyone, but the speed with which scientists have responded to a constantly evolving situation. And it's this extraordinary coming together of people, scientists across the world, that's going to be key to navigating through this crisis. While in these scary times, the newscast team bring you the very latest on coronavirus. You can download it daily from the BBC Sounds app. And before news night at 10.45, something to make us smile live at the Apollo.